Hi, this is Carrie Corbett Owen from BodyWisePerfectSize.com, speaking to Isabel Fox and Duke about women, body image, and so much more. Isabel, what's your story? How did you get involved in this work? I, I was diagnosed as a fat baby when I was very young, like two or three years for lack of a better word. My parents were told by my pediatrician they put me on my first diet when I was three because I was sort of high. I was high on the baby BMI scale. And I basically have been diet binge cycling or I was diet binge cycling my whole life starting at that young age. I don't have any memories of having a quote unquote normal relationship with food. I always felt that out of control around food. I always felt like my appetites were too much. And I always felt like my body was not okay and my body was too big from a very, very young age on. Uh, and that was just always the case. Um, I uh, definitely at some point, you know, I, I identified at some point in my life, I sort of asked myself, you know, I, why am I feeling this way? Why do, I, why do I feel like there's not enough food in the world to satisfy me? And at the time, the answer that was given to me was, oh, you're a compulsive overeater, you're a binge eater, you're struggling with you know, emotional eating, you're, essentially you're a food addict. And so that was how I identified myself for a really, really long time, which is I think how a lot of women identify themselves. It's like, I, for whatever reason, do not fit some thin ideal, so I engage with the diet binge cycle, but I don't realize that the dieting is actually causing a lot of these this, these feelings of out of control and this lack of satiety. I just think that there must be something wrong with me that I can't stick to my diet. And so therefore, I you know identify with like this phrase compulsive eater, emotional eater, binge eater, et cetera. And you know, obviously, you know, a lot of times, you know, these these compulsive feelings around food, you know, easily line up with my emotions which there's a lot of reasons for, which are really interesting. But ultimately, at the end of the day, there is no doubt, you know, I've never met anyone um, identify with the term emotional eater who didn't have some sort of restrictive history with food in some capacity before. You know, these two things are, are clearly linked. But I didn't, um, I didn't realize that, how, how linked exactly they were at the time. I really thought that I had some sort of like fundamental def defect and I was just sort of born a food addict and that was just my lot in life. Um, so yeah, so it was really, um, I went to rehab for binge eating when I was 19 and for many years after that, I was just look, like, looking for the answer to binge eating, looking for the answer to emotional eating, looking for the answer to quote unquote compulsive overeating. Um, but I really in searching for the answer, I really thought, a once I figure it out, I'll be thin or I'll have a specific kind of body type. And I also thought, you know, to some extent, I thought that the answer was to try and, quote, get control of my food, um, not realizing that it was actually my attempts at trying to gain control over my food and trying to make myself eat a certain way or try to make my food look a certain way that actually was causing the vast majority of this kind of rebellious behavior. And that was something that was not really... Um, in my opinion, fully addressed, even in my clinical treatment, even in some of, you know, going to one of the best rehabs in the world, I didn't really feel like that was, I was, I was made to fully understand that until way, way, way later in, in my own sort of research and studies. And so I'm really trying to um, address that particular issue in my work. Isabel, how did you start realizing that you weren't the problem? You know, it's interesting because I had brief moments of understanding that when I first discovered intuitive eating and when I first discovered mindful eating. Um, you know, people like Janine Roth and, and people like Susie Orbach and there are all these incredible women in the 70s who were sort of talking about diet binge cycling to some extent. Um, but what I think is sort of what I realized was that um, there's there's layers to restriction, and there's there's levels of dieting. And dieting is not just so simple as just oh I'm on Weight Watchers or I'm on Atkins and and I can't stick to it and it's unsustainable and therefore I'm falling off. Dieting is really a state of mind. It's a mentality around food, um, and I think that I was engaging in a lot of restrictive behaviors. But saying that I wasn't dieting, you know, like there was this sense of knowing that dieting caused binge eating. And I would always think to myself, well, I'm not dieting. I'm just, you know, fervently trying to eat only when I'm hungry, no matter what, you know, like I'm not dieting. I'm just ferv. I'm just, you know, just dedicated to making sure that I don't eat past the point of full, no matter what. 
I'm not dieting. I'm just dedicated to making sure that my food only looks like this specific kind of way or that my food looks the way I think, quote unquote, normal eaters food should look. Right. And so, um, you know, I, I, uh, I think that this term dieting is actually one of the most complicated terms and one of the most, like the definition of dieting is so, um, you know, you ask somebody what is a diet and I, I get a million different answers for that all the time. And I think mo a lot, I think there are a lot of women struggling with diet binge cycling who would claim to not be on diets. In fact, that that is one of the most common um, responses I hear to my work is, but Isabella, I'm not dieting anymore. But in actuality, they very much are dieting. They are judging every bite of food that goes into their mouth. They are trying to control their food and their weight um, it, you know, to some extent or another. Um, they are trying to be careful around food. They're trying to, you know, they're trying to control their, their natural instincts around food to some extent. Um, and I think that that's, you know, I think that this whole idea, this whole idea of diets don't work has sort of been co actually, oddly enough, co-opted by the diet industry itself. You know, there's so many non-diet approaches to weight loss out there, which really are just diets, but they're just claiming not to be. It's like very strange. I don't really understand it or like how they get away with it. But, but it's, it's, it's really interesting how, um, you know, it's sort of like almost common knowledge at this point, quote unquote, diets don't work. But the vast majority of people who use that exact phrase are promoting some sort of diet in reality when you really get down to it. What do you think about some of the cultural dictates when it comes to weight? Um, I mean, they are completely out of control. I mean, I think that, you know, I really, um, I think Naomi Wolf is a person who I respect a lot, who talks a lot about this, but essentially it's sort of like for all of the freedoms that women have been afforded, particularly in the past, you know, 40, 50 years, it seems that as we have gained more freedom and independence in certain areas, the pressures to look a certain way while enjoying those freedoms have just gotten more and more severe. Um, which is really interesting. There seems to be, I mean, I think that there's obviously always been pressure on women to look a certain way, but it's almost like the more, you know, autonomy you have in the workplace, the more capable you are, you know, making your own money and taking care of yourself, the thinner you have to be to do it, it with respect. Um, and yeah, it's really uh, sort of terrifying. I feel like it's sort of this, it's, it's, it's a major form of social control that is, uh, seeming to oppress women in greater and greater numbers as we potentially theoretically are making strides in other areas of women's social life. It seems to me there's a huge discrepancy between our cultural needs and what our biology needs. Which, by the way, is on purpose. I mean, that is that is functional. I mean, the whole idea behind weight being an issue of social status is that weight becomes important or valuable, the more rare it is and the more difficult it is to attain. And so it's, it doesn't shock me that, you know, the more difficult a body is to create or have, or the more rare a particular body type is, the more valuable it is. What's just interesting and what I think is so screwed up about the diet industry in particular is that we are selling this idea that like you can, anyone can have this body as long as you work hard enough, as opposed to realizing that by definition, the only reason anyone cares about having it is because it is biologically difficult to attain. You know, no one would care about being thin if everyone could do it. It just would be this thing that everybody has. Um, so it's sort of like it's this paradox of, oh, you can have it if you work hard enough and everyone can achieve, you know, this ultimate thin ideal if they just do the right things. But ultimately, that's just fundamentally not true. And if it were true, we, we, by definition, wouldn't care about it. It wouldn't have any value or status associated with it because anyone could have it across the class, you know, across classes, social groups, et cetera. Obviously, there's a big class component involved as well because it is easier for wealthier people to attain, you know, certain physical shapes and sizes. Not by that much. I mean, I think that there are tons of, you know, rich people across the boards who still can't control their bodies 100%. Um, but theoretically, right, and to some extent, it is easier to attain a certain body, at least for a short term period of time, um, when you can afford to go to Soul Cycle every day, and when you can, you know, have a private Pilates instructor, and you can have organic gourmet meals, like you know, catered to your every whim. You know, those things obviously have some impact, and so there's there's really a, a 
class component to this. And and this is ultimately just another way for us to sort of, you know, thinness on one level is like another way to demonstrate wealth. So how do you stop women worrying about their bodies? Um, I think that there's sort of two components to it that I think are most important. One is sort of demystifying and debunking these this myth that my weight is in my control and that I am the you know, explicit dictator of my body and that I get to, you know, I can make my body look however I want it to look. The reality is that from like a science-based perspective, that's just fundamentally not true. Really, no matter how much money you have. I mean, that's that's the truth. Like no matter who you are, no matter what, most humans are just not capable of sustainably controlling their bodies and making their bodies look a certain way. And I think that what keeps women crazy is this belief that they not only can but should be doing those things right like this belief that I can just you know cash in my on my thin ideal so to speak right this idea that if I just work hard enough and I just you know find the perfect diet find the perfect meal plan whatever it may be I can literally force my body to look like what I want it to look like I can make my biology bend to my will you know is is really, I think, what is you know sort of the core problem. It's the core lie that the diet industry feeds on, um, and I think that you know when women start to really realize, oh, that's actually not the case. I'm actually not necessarily capable of making my body bend to my will, like at my discretion. Like my body is a living human mammal organism that has a weight that it wants to be, that it is fighting to maintain, that is natural to it at any given time, and I don't necessarily get to choose what that is. And if I try and screw with it, the reality of the situation is at some point it will fight back. At some point I will rebel. That's what binge eating is. Binge eating is, I could make the argument, a natural response to deprivation, a natural reaction to starvation, right? So um, yeah, so I think that first off it's really about, you know, explaining to women in different ways and really challenging this idea that I can and should control my body, really can more than should. I mean, I think we all intellectually understand that, you know, these social pressures are kind of ridiculous, but we still try and go after them because we think, oh my gosh, well, social pressures are what they are and, you know, I still want to be loved and, you know, better, I guess I have just better do this thing. I guess I better just diet and try and make myself as thin as I possibly can. I think for me, it was much more impactful when I read, you know, Health at Every Size and started learning about weight set point theory and all of these other ideas. And I realized like, oh, not only is it a ridiculous that I should be looking a certain way, I also am not probably capable in the long run of forcing my body to look different than it does. Um, and I think that that was sort of like a really, really key moment for me. I, I often talk about that as like, you know, you don't need to love your body necessarily in order to accept the reality of the situation that your body probably just is what it is. Um, and I think that that's a really, really hard, it's a really hard thing to face. Um, and it is also um, a very challenging thing to believe. I think most, it's, it, it, it's the most countercultural thing in the world. You know, like everyone around you is telling you it's just a matter of eating the right foods. It's just a matter of doing the right thing. It's just a matter of, um, you know, dieting basically and, and willpower. But the reality of the situation is that we simply do not have an answer to permanent thinness. I mean, this just doesn't exist. Like, hence the phrase diets don't work. We have not found a way to make, you know, more than a very, very tiny fraction of the population permanently thinner. So, you know, I think that that's, um, that's sort of wherein lies the rub. And, and I would say you wouldn't believe, you know, how much of my time is spent trying to explain this idea that like our weight is not necessarily in our full control and we don't necessarily get to choose the bodies we have in different ways because most it's very it's a very hard reality for people to face and people have a lot of objections to it people have a lot of objections to that reality people have a lot of resistance to that reality you know everyone wants to hold on to the idea that there's something that they can do to be like the winner of the of the weight lottery
So yes, I think that that sort of number one is really easing people into that idea. And you would be amazed at how difficult that idea really is for people to wrap their brains around. I mean, it is really very, very challenging. Um, and people, you know, people will say to me, oh, I understand that my weight's not in my control, but if I just eat this, or if I just don't eat that, I mean, it's literally, it's like constantly this, like these poking up little threads of, but, but what about this loophole? What about that loophole? So yeah, I would say, you know, 50% of my work is just trying to get is, is really like helping women wrap their brains around that concept. Um, and then the other 50% is like, okay, so once you have acceptance, once you really realize like, okay, this is a pointless, fruitless endeavor, like me trying to change the way my body looks through force is probably not going to work out for me in the long run. Like once you get there, once you live in acceptance, and you just sort of kind of come to grips with reality, honestly, then it starts to become a question of, okay, these are my circumstances. How can I live my best life? How can I, you know, kind of look at the glass half full, to be honest, like, how can I start to turn acceptance into love, which is a whole separate conversation. But I always say, like, generally, in my experience, for 95% of my clients, acceptance happens before love happens. Isabel, what's the journey from acceptance to love? What lies between them? I think that there's a lot of different answers to that question. I think that um, one of the most powerful ones, though, is being able to come up with a countercultural ideal for yourself. So that's where things like being able to actually visually expose yourself to media images of body diversity is important. That's why things like the Out of Positivity Project are so important. That's why, you know, the fact that plus size models are somehow blowing up social media is so important. You know, being actually able to like look at an image of somebody who looks like you or maybe doesn't look like you but just has a, a you know an alternative body shape that you wouldn't necessarily see in the media and see them doing it with pride and seeing them do it with confidence and seeing them really owning themselves I think can be really powerful in helping you know any individual kind of do the same like oh I don't actually need to look like Christy Brinkley in order to in, in order to to kind of like wear cool clothes or you know have a you know glamorous life really I mean however you define that for yourself you know have a luxurious like happy life of your dreams so to speak um, you know people like Virgie Tovar who's you know one of my closest friends in California and somebody who I respect just immensely you know I think one of the reasons that people are so attracted to her is because if you look go through her Instagram account or a lot of her social media a lot of what she's demonstrating is just her looking like she's having a lot of fun and having a blast in you know the alternative body shape in which she lives in which she lives that you don't see in the media as often as I would personally like to see it more body diversity you know so um, I think that that's you know being able to imagine yourself potentially through the help of role models but even just using your imagination like being able to learn to imagine yourself living an amazing life and sort of having you know incredible friendships and incredible love and a healthy romantic sexual life these kinds of things being able to imagine those things happening being able to imagine having the life that you want in an alternative body shape or size is really sort of the key because ultimately most people don't care about being thin in a vacuum. They care about being thin because of what they think thinness is going to bring them, because of what they think thinness is going to do for them in their life, which usually has to do with attracting more love, having happy, healthy, sexual, romantic relationships, you know, gaining social status in the world, having lots of friends, right? And so when you can imagine having, you know, having a bigger life and expanding your life and, and sort of creating the life for yourself that you want in an alternative body shape or size like that's I think when body love really starts to happen. It even means you have to really look at your friendships and probably change some of them. So that's one of the hardest things about doing this work and about sort of you know recovering from food issues however you define that for yourself is that um, it's hard to turn over friendships. It is hard to rebuild social relationships from scratch and I think that that's one of that's one of the biggest obstacles that my clients come across is, you know, all of my friends are basically weight discriminating, diet obsessed people. My whole family is weight discriminating and diet obsessed. You know, what do I do? You know, I have, I don't know who to hang out with. And I always just tell people, you know, um, if there are specific people that you know you need to set boundaries with, do it. But, you know, that you're, you're 
I think a lot of your happiness is going to come from not necessarily only focusing on taking out problematic people, but you got to add good people in. You got to go seek out friendships that are nourishing and, and, and supporting to you given your sort of new value system of body positivity. And I really describe it as a value system, you know, like body positivity is a value system of mine and I want to have people in my life who have the same values as me. Sometimes it's also necessary to go on a media diet though. Everyone goes through their social media accounts, they delete anyone who is triggering to them really for any reason. And I allow that to I allow them to define that however they want. You know, it doesn't need to be you know, the Fitzbo people only that they're getting rid of, you know, sometimes it just might be a person in their life, a personal friend who is posting pictures that make them feel comfortable, uncomfortable. You know, if somebody, if looking at pictures of someone makes you triggered or makes you not feel good about yourself, like get rid of them. I mean, we can have a conversation about why that is. And, you know, if there's something specific going on that might be triggering you that, that, requires deeper conversation. Um, but I think ultimately, like, one of the amazing things about social media is that you really can curate your social media to make you feel good. And so if something doesn't make you feel good, get rid of it. What's the point of having it there? There's really no need for it to be there. Um, and then simultaneously, I always say also, you know, especially with social media and going on a media diet, it's not just about what you take out, it's also about what you put in. You know, are you consuming regular body positive media on a regular basis because the truth of the matter is is you can clean out your whole Facebook you can clean out your whole Instagram but it is basically impossible to avoid weight unfortunately it is impossible to avoid weight discriminating fat phobic messages in this world I think you know you're going to be driving down the highway and you're going to see the beach body ad to your left right so to some extent you need to combat the negative noise with body positive media it's not enough just to take out the bad, you know, sort of fat phobic messages, you have to also put in the body positive, you know, uh, body accepting messages as sort of a combat against um, any negative messages that are likely unavoidable at this point in our society's history. What's your take on intuitive eating? I mean, intuitive eating is a wonderful tool. It's not the answer to feeling crazy around food in and of itself. I think the answer to feeling crazy around food in and of, is really more about body acceptance and some of these other issues that we're talking about. But intuitive eating is a really, really great tool for people who have dieted their whole lives and feel like they've lost touch with their body signals and don't know how to make decisions around food outside of dieting. Um, intuitive That's really the function and the purpose of intuitive eating for me. I teach intuitive eating as a tool for getting back in touch with your body's sort of natural wisdom around food because so many dieters lose that ability. They lose touch. They don't even know. I mean, I remember thinking, I don't even know when I'm hungry. What does hunger even mean? Um, what do you mean to eat when you're hungry and stop when you're full? I, I can't even wrap my brain around that. When I was really, really deep in the dieting, that didn't even make sense to me. Ultimately, if you still are, you know, engaging in sort of weight manipulative, you know, thoughts and belief systems around food, like that's, I mean, you can even turn intuitive eating into a diet. And trust me, lots of people have. There's a lot of people pushing the intuitive eating for weight loss train and it doesn't end well. This is Carrie Corbett Owen from Bodywise Perfect Size. To watch the second part of my fascinating interview with Isabel Fox Dukin, Go to our Hayes videos on Bodywise Perfect Size. You can find that there as well as many other experts.